Russian company Ross Atom announces that it has come significantly closer to achieving what's known as a closed nuclear fuel cycle. This breakthrough could potentially resolve a major issue in modern nuclear energy and ensure humanity's energy security in the near future. The concept itself isn't entirely new, but for many decades its realization remained in the realm of science fiction. Only now does it seem that it might materialize into reality. Subscribe to our channel and let's dive into understanding what this closed fuel cycle is, why it's necessary, and why scientists have yet to implement it in practice. The primary fuel for nuclear reactors is uranium, thanks to a process known as forced nuclear fission. The core absorbs a neutron, becomes unstable, and splits into two smaller fragments. The total mass of the fragments is less than the original atom's mass, releasing energy as per Einstein's formula E equals mc squared. Furthermore, several neutrons are released during this fission, theoretically capable of triggering the fission of other nuclei, generating more energy and more neutrons. These will cause more atoms to split, creating a chain reaction. While in most cases, the energy stored within radioactive atoms is slowly released due to nuclear decay, in forced fission reactions, we can control the release of this energy by regulating the neutron flow's power, absorbing a certain portion of released neutrons through various means. The problem lies in the fact that only a few radioactive materials are capable of sustaining the chain reaction of forced fission. Not all uranium nuclei can do this. Specifically, only the isotope uranium-235 with 92 protons and 143 neutrons in its core can sustain the reaction. Natural uranium contains only about 0.7% uranium-235, while 99.3% is uranium-238 with 92 protons and 146 neutrons, which does not support this reaction. Hence, most efforts spent on mining uranium ore, purifying it, and more end up in vain. Over 99% of the product from these technological processes turns out to be practically useless waste, which is quite frustrating. But it's not just about monetary considerations. Natural uranium reserves are quite limited. Utilizing only 0.7% of these reserves as nuclear fuel severely restricts the resource base of nuclear energy. Explored uranium reserves on Earth are estimated to sustain current nuclear power plants for only 50 to 100 years. With an expansion in nuclear energy usage, which I'm confident will happen, this duration will be even shorter. However, it was soon discovered that waste uranium-238 isn't entirely useless. Under certain conditions, it can be converted into nuclear fuel. When it absorbs a neutron, it transforms into uranium-239. Uranium-239 undergoes beta decay, on average, in 23 minutes. One of its neutrons turns into a proton, resulting in 93 protons and 146 neutrons, becoming neptunium-239. Neptunium, on average, undergoes another beta decay within two days, resulting in 94 protons and 145 neutrons, creating plutonium-239. Fortunately, plutonium-239 can also sustain a chain reaction of forced fission, serving as nuclear fuel. In simpler terms, by bombarding useless uranium-238 with a powerful neutron flow, we produce a valuable amount of plutonium-239. These strong neutron flows are readily available in operating nuclear reactors. In other words, we can place a certain amount of uranium-238 in a working reactor where it turns into plutonium. We'll extract this plutonium and create fuel for a new cycle of reactor operation, producing more plutonium from uranium-238 and so on. To be precise, there's no need to specially introduce uranium-238. Nuclear fuel used in nuclear power plants mainly consists of uranium-238, although the proportion of fuel, uranium-235 in it, is increased, averaging up to 5%. In essence, any nuclear reactor during its operation produces fuel for itself as a byproduct. The idea of the closed fuel cycle revolves around making reactors operate on the fuel they've previously generated for themselves. In reality, this cycle isn't entirely closed since uranium-238 is consumed during the process. However, considering the mountains of uranium accumulated over the years of nuclear energy existence, the concept is undeniably promising. However, as is almost always the case in nuclear energy, it's easier said than done. In practice, things turned out to be, to put it mildly, a bit more complex. 
Take, for instance, the simple fact that ordinary nuclear reactors aren't particularly adept at converting uranium-238 into plutonium. As we mentioned earlier, nuclear fuel always contains some amount of uranium-238. Absorption of neutrons by its atoms is generally considered an undesirable phenomenon. Indeed, if a significant portion of the neutrons produced during the fission of uranium-235 are captured by uranium-238 atoms, they won't be available to initiate new acts of uranium-235 fission, thereby halting the chain reaction. So, in the early days of nuclear energy, scientists and engineers had to put considerable effort into minimizing neutron capture by uranium-238. One way, of course, is to increase the proportion of uranium-235 in the fuel and decrease the amount of uranium-238. Unfortunately, separating uranium-235 from uranium-238 is a non-trivial task since these atoms are chemically identical and differ only slightly in mass, just over 1%. Hence, isolating the right uranium from the wrong uranium, or enriching uranium fuel, is quite a challenge. While this task must be addressed to prevent nuclear fuel from being exorbitantly expensive, it can't be the sole solution. The most successful idea was incorporating layers of a substance capable of slowing down the neutrons passing through it, what's known as a moderator. It turns out that uranium-238 more effectively absorbs fast-moving neutrons, while uranium-235 interacts better with slow or thermal neutrons. By reducing the energy of the neutrons, we simultaneously increase the efficiency of the uranium-235 fission chain reaction and decrease losses due to neutron absorption by uranium-238. This gives us the ability to sustain the chain reaction using cheaper fuel with a lower degree of enrichment. This works well for traditional reactors. However, it undermines the concept of a closed cycle. Reactors using thermal neutrons, which practically all modern reactors belong to, produce very little plutonium per unit of burnt nuclear fuel, thus making it impossible to close the fuel cycle. To achieve this, one needs to abandon the idea of slowing down neutrons and employ fast neutrons to initiate the reaction. However, this is easier said than done. For instance, in classical reactors, ordinary water is used to remove the thermal energy from the active zone. But for fast neutron reactors, water isn't suitable as it's a good moderator. So another liquid coolant needs to be used. But what? Originally, mercury was considered, but it quickly became apparent that this was, to put it mildly, not the best idea. Mercury is toxic by itself, and handling radioactive mercury is questionable. Moreover, mercury is chemically active, forming amalgams with many metals, among other issues. A more successful idea emerged, using sodium as the coolant, melting at 98 degrees Celsius and boiling at 883 degrees Celsius. In a broad range of temperatures, sodium retains its properties as a coolant and almost doesn't absorb or slow down neutrons. However, sodium has its downsides, such as its tendency to react violently with both air's oxygen and water. To avoid sodium's contact with these substances, complex measures are necessary. For instance, the reactors need to be designed not with two loops, like typical water reactors, but with three loops. Sodium passing through the reactor first transfers the heat to another sodium loop, and the pipes from this second loop cool down with regular water, which then powers the turbines. Additionally, fast reactors operate at higher temperatures, imposing additional requirements on the materials used in their construction. These materials must retain their structural properties better within the powerful neutron fields typical for fast neutron reactors. In extracting plutonium from spent nuclear fuel, things weren't straightforward either. Natural uranium and even enriched uranium fuel are relatively weakly radioactive. They can be handled with minimal precautions, mostly related to the chemical toxicity of uranium rather than its radioactivity. However, spent nuclear fuel is a different story. During the fission reactions, it becomes enriched with highly radioactive substances. Its reprocessing requires technologies that exclude human presence, involving lead chambers, remote manipulators, and the like. Overall, all of this is highly complex and quite costly. Due to the complexity and expense, most countries that once experimented with fast neutron reactors, such as the USA, France, Germany, and Japan, fairly quickly reverted to traditional slow neutron reactors. The French reactor Phoenix lasted the longest, finally closed in 2009. 
Afterward, for some time, the Russian BN-600 at the Beloyarsk nuclear power plant remained the only industrial reactor operating on fast neutrons, and in 2016, it was joined by the more powerful BN-800. Consequently, Russia became the sole country continuing the development of closed fuel cycle technology. As is often the case in science and technology, persistence pays off. Russian nuclear scientists' perseverance produced results. Currently, the BN-800 is the world's first reactor that has operated for an entire year using fuel obtained through reprocessing spent nuclear fuel. However, this isn't yet a closed cycle. The neutron fields in the BN-800 are still not strong enough for the fuel to produce an equivalent amount of plutonium during the reactor's runtime on one fuel load. In essence, the BN-800 currently operates as a waste reprocessing reactor, including regular waste from thermal reactors operating on slow neutrons. This fuel, comprising a mixture of oxides of various uranium and plutonium isotopes, is known as MOX fuel. Nonetheless, this process is valuable, allowing energy extraction from what would otherwise remain a burden in spent fuel storage. Additionally, through this secondary reprocessing of the fuel in reactors, many long-lived radioactive isotopes are burnt, making this fuel suitable for safe disposal within a few decades. This method partly addresses the second key problem in nuclear energy, the issue of radioactive waste. The most important part, it's almost proven that industrial reactors can be fueled with this secondary fuel, and it works, producing a significant amount of energy. So a closed fuel cycle is possible, not just theoretically, but practically. All that remains is to build reactors capable of producing sufficient plutonium to close the cycle. This requires even more powerful neutron fluxes, implying additional technical solutions that need to be developed and implemented. One of these solutions involves a shift from the traditionally used uranium and plutonium oxide-based fuel to nitrides, which are compounds of these metals with nitrogen. Indeed, if the mass used in reactors, uranium dioxide with the chemical formula UO2 has a density of 11 grams per cubic centimeter, uranium nitride is 14.3, which is one-third more, enabling one-third higher uranium nucleus density per reactor volume, and consequently, a denser neutron flux. Similar density increases are observed in plutonium. However, the seemingly straightforward operation of replacing oxide with nitride requires a fundamental overhaul of the entire fuel chemistry and slight modifications in reactor design. However, the launch of the first closed cycle reactors is planned for the near future. In 2029, the simultaneous launch of two such reactors is scheduled. Firstly, it's the BN-1200 reactor, the older sibling of the BN-600 and BN-800 reactors constructed at the same Beloyarsk nuclear power plant. Secondly, it's the BREST reactor, planned to be launched at a new site in Siversk. BREST is still being considered more as an experimental project. It's a fundamentally different type of reactor, distinct from the BN series reactors. For example, in these reactors, they decided to replace sodium as the coolant with liquid lead, a significantly more inert chemical compound that doesn't fear accidental contact with water or air. Another innovative feature of the BREST reactors is the concept of inherent safety. According to this concept, the reactor should be designed so that in case of failure of certain reactor systems, the chain reaction ceases automatically and the release of radioactive materials into the environment becomes impossible. In the BREST reactor, the active zone containing the nuclear fuel is immersed in a kind of pool of molten lead. Even if the pumps that circulate the coolant shut down, the circulation continues naturally due to convection. Additionally, lead has the property of absorbing gamma radiation well, ensuring that whatever happens inside the reactor stays inside. I won't delve too deeply into the engineering details of the BREST project right now, especially since there are people on YouTube who understand this better than I do and explain it more competently. In theory, Reactors like BREST should be even safer than the familiar slow neutron reactors while allowing operation in a closed fuel cycle, generating energy while producing fuel for themselves in the future. However, there might be a vast array of nuances and unexpected complexities. Nuclear scientists still need to discover what these challenges might be and how to navigate them. 
which is impossible without building an experimental reactor. In essence, the reactor under construction in Seversk will not just generate electricity, although it will certainly do that, but will serve as a testing ground for refining technologies. If all goes well, only after several decades will reactors like B-REST go into mass production, much like what happened previously with BN series reactors. Now, the BN-1200 reactor, yes, it will operate commercially, producing electricity for widespread use, also based on the closed fuel cycle. So yes, the closed fuel cycle might become a reality by 2029 if everything goes according to plan, which isn't always the case in nuclear energy. The practical implementation of closed fuel cycle technology will provide humanity with numerous advantages. Firstly, as mentioned earlier, we gain the ability to involve hitherto useless uranium-238 in the nuclear cycle, allowing us to increase the resource base of nuclear energy hundreds of times over and expand our nuclear fuel reserves to last not just decades, but thousands of years, almost indefinitely in human terms. Secondly, it will partially solve the issue of radioactive waste from the nuclear industry. We can't completely eliminate it, but we can remove a significant portion of long-lived radionuclides. This enables safe disposal after a relatively short delay, adhering to the principle of equivalence, so that, roughly speaking, we bury in the Earth material with the same radioactivity as the ore we extracted from the Earth earlier. Thirdly, theoretically, we might be able to do away with the costly nuclear fuel enrichment industry. Separating plutonium from the fuel mixture is much simpler than separating isotopes of the same element, such as uranium. However, as I mentioned earlier, such work requires adherence to heightened radiation safety measures, meaning it's not cheap in itself. But according to closed cycle enthusiasts, after mastering the technology, reprocessing spent fuel for new fuel could be cheaper than enrichment. This comes in handy because, costly in construction and operation, fast neutron reactors are more expensive than their slower counterparts, meaning the energy they produce will also be more expensive. If preliminary fuel enrichment savings can reduce the cost of this energy to traditional values for nuclear energy, or better, even lower, this would be very helpful. Finally, fourthly, it would be great if the newest generations of nuclear reactors helped solve what is perhaps the most worrying problem, the catastrophic consequences of potential accidents at nuclear power stations. By the way, scientists and engineers in various countries are working most actively in this direction, and there are already very interesting developments, for instance, related to creating compact, low-power reactors. But if my dear viewers are interested, we can talk about this in more detail next time.